You get your life changed, you're like, man, this book is probably the most interesting thing I will ever read. Before you get your life changed, you think, this book is the most boring thing I've ever read. The Bible says that the natural man or the unsaved, the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because he is spiritually discerned. So what does that mean? It means if you don't know the Lord, this is foolish to you, and you won't be able to know it because you're spiritually broken. But <laughs> when God turns the lights on, suddenly this is awesome. He said, was it always awesome? Depends on how close you are to the Lord. You get close to him, it's always awesome. You, you drag your feet a little bit and get far, a little ways away from him, which happens to everybody, by the way. It becomes harder to read, but it's always better than it was, amen. First Timothy chapter number one, last week we started a series in the book of Timothy. We just finished Colossians not long ago, and I believe we preached in Colossians for at least a year, maybe a little bit more, uh, and it was good on Sunday mornings, and so who knows how long we'll be in the book of Timothy, but we're going to preach through it, and uh, it's a great book. Let's go ahead and read, uh, we're going to read the first 11 verses. The uh, Bible says, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, that means vain talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane. For murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. Now, I want everybody to understand, the human writer of this book is a man called Paul, the Apostle Paul. He was a Christian killer. He was a religious man, didn't care about God, and God saved him. And suddenly he became interested in everything God was interested in, like he does with anybody else that gets saved. And God committed a lot to his trust in verse 11. The glorious gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection to go tell everybody about that. As a preacher or as a Christian, God has committed that to his tr your trust, the glorious gospel. And God and Paul are writing to a man named Timothy, trying to help him in how to run the church and how to be the leader and the man of God and the Christian he is to be. And so today we're going to look at this and see how it applies to our life. And so we need this. We need the Lord to blow in and blow up. And to show us something from the word of God. And if you'll concentrate and you'll purpose in your heart to listen to the Lord today, he'll speak to you and he'll help you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And Lord, I thank you for the word of God and what it means to me. What a, what a glorious book. What an what a exciting book. And Lord, it's amazing how this 
book changes the lives of everyone that lets it. And God, today I ask you to do that amongst us on a Sunday morning. Deep preaching for the Sunday morning crowd. But God, may we all become faithful in the Lord's work, in the Lord's house, and we be labeled God's people, faithful and true to him. Help us today, bless the song that has come, help the kids as they practice and prayed, and may we see you in it all, and may we hear from you today in the preaching of your word. We love you, and we need you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing so long. Grandpa's been a preacher for many faithful years. Preaching in a country church, his Bible stained with tears. He told about salvation's plan. And how God became a man Growing up I heard this story Time and time again But I made it mine The story he was telling Of a Savior sent from heaven for Don't look at me like that. You guys do the same thing. Don't worry. You ever look for your car keys and they're in your hand? Who's ever done that? Raise your hand. Don't lie either. All right, good. At least some of us are truthful because I think everybody, you ever look for your cell phone and it's in your hand? Okay, we're getting better there. We're getting warmer. Hector, I haven't seen you raise your hand at all. None of that happened to you? <laughs> no, not this Hector. This Hector, he's, like, he's going to raise his hand on something. So you got it all. Have you ever looked for your glasses and they were on your face? 
They are, yeah, they're up here like that, yeah. Uh, amen. All right, good. I just want to make sure everybody was with me. We're all not, I'm not the only crazy one in here, praise God. That's good. I want to talk to you today. Uh, I, I get the title later. I'm not even sure if I have a title uh, to this. I really just want to preach what the Lord's uh, given us here. And I, I want you to see some things. We talked last week about the Apostle Paul being the Apostle of Jesus. He was a messenger of Jesus. God called him to do what he did, and, and God calls people to do that. And it was God's commandment that Paul followed in verse 1. And, and he's our Savior. He, he's the Savior of the world. Not just the Lord, he's the Savior. And, and what, a, what a great hope that is. That word hope doesn't mean I'm hoping he's real. That word hope means I'm confident he is everything that he says he is. And so he's talking to Timothy, and he, we believe he won Timothy to Jesus, possibly. And he calls him his own son in the, in the faith. And Timothy was the pastor of the church at Ephesus where Paul had sent him. And, and things were getting tough there, and he was young, uh, because he's covert, referred to as young Timothy sometimes. He was young, and they weren't really listening to him, maybe. We don't know exactly what was going on, but he starts telling, uh, these, uh, telling Timothy, Paul, and the Holy Ghost starts saying, Timothy, I charge you. And look what he says in verse number uh, uh, three at the end of it. He says, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And, and doctrine is what we believe the word of God teaches. Not, and, and I don't mean believe as in a, a something that is uh, not completely, we're not sure of. I'm talking about what we believe. And, and the word of God is very simple, and I've said this before many times. I don't say this arrogantly. I say this confidently. If you believe the word of God in its context, which means not just finding a verse and trying to explain what it means, but explaining it as it is written in the passage. So you can make the Bible say anything if you just take a verse here and there. Matter of fact, we can make any of us say anything. That's what they do on TV sometimes. They quote one statement a person says. Instead of quoting everything he was talking about, it makes him seem like he's lying, did something wrong. And so the doctrines that we get from the Word of God make us Baptist. Why does that make us a Baptist, Brother Bert? Because the doctrines taught in this Bible are Baptist doctrines that we believe the virgin birth. We don't believe she was just a young woman. We believe she was a virgin. We, don't, we believe Jesus is coming back to get us one day. We believe that his, his blood cleanses us from all sin. We believe that he stood on the cross as our substitute, the vicarious suffering of the Savior. We believe in a pastor. We believe in a deacon. We, we, those are the offices of the church. We believe the Bible's inspired, unerrant, inerrant. Uh, we believe the Baptist doctrine. And as we read this, Paul tells Timothy, charge them that they teach no other doctrine. Because what was happening in the church possibly, or in people's lives when they left the church, they were being told a lie. That's not true what Timothy is teaching. This is what's true. And I have no problem ever sitting down with a person that has false doctrine and opening up this King James Bible and talking about what they're talking about. I can absolutely prove to you that there is no tongue talking in this Bible the way the modern churches make it to believe. Uh, that that started in 1902 by a man who developed a church of his, own, of his own. I can take my Bible and show you why I'm not AJW. I can take my Bible and show you why I'm not a Mormon. I can take you why my Bible, my Bible will show you why I'm a Bible believer and why I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's called doctrine. And so he was teaching Timothy, hey, charge them that they teach no other doctrine, Timothy. Don't let them do it. That word charge gives the sense of a, a general telling, giving a command to a lesser, uh, uh, to, a, to maybe a private or to someone of lesser rank. Everybody follow me on that? That's a, that's a military word there, that charge. And I like the military words of the Bible. I like the military. I love it. I think it's great. And he says, hey, charge them that they teach no other doctrine, Timothy. Don't let them do it. We believe what we believe through the word of God. You show them the word of God and you help them. It was a command. Now, hold your place right there in 1 Timothy and turn right over to the next book, which is called 2 Timothy. And I want you to look at something with me and look at chapter 
chapter number two of 2 Timothy. And I want you to see something. Later on, Paul would write another book to Timothy through the inspired, uh, to God, I'm, I'm sorry, by the Holy Spirit's power. And that's why we have it in scripture. It's not a man written book. It's a God breathed book. And in chapter number two, here's what he tells Timothy. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And I like verse three and four. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a mamby pamby Christian. It's not what it says. He said, chosen him to be a soldier. And I like it a whole bunch. Timothy, this is what we do. We teach men that are able to teach other men. And that's what we're trying to do. And, and with, with the word of God is teach, teach men and women how to live for God and tell other people about God. And that was important when Paul teach Timothy to do that. Timothy, tell him not to teach any other doctrine because their doctrine ain't doctrine. It's made up man's religion. And we don't need man's religion because man's religion doesn't do anything but dress the outside up and does nothing for the inside. And, and Paul was very, very quick to help Timothy. Go back to chapter number one of our chap, uh, First Timothy chapter number one. Now I want you to see some things. What was he saying to Timothy? Timothy, you're not only the pastor of a church in a difficult city, but you're also a Christian soldier under the orders of the king. Now pass these orders along to the soldiers in your church. I like it. You know, I like, I like, I like, I like men. I, I like everybody in church. Don't get me wrong, man. We got some great ladies in this church, and then the backbone of our church might be our ladies. But I like men to teach men to be men yeah. and to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and to be a soldier. And God called them soldiers in the word of God. And that's what we are to be as soldiers. Not, not, not sellouts. Not, not, not little sissies. But, but soldiers. Man up. Buckle up. Strap that belt up. Pull their pants up. And be a man. And Timothy was being learning to do that. And so pass the orders along, Timothy. And so, number one, I want you to see this. We are soldiers of the king carrying out orders from a king. <laughs> That's what we are. Soldiers of the king carrying out orders from the king. And, and, and doctrine is important. And that's what he was telling them. The doctrines of the gospel are the principles and truths of the word of God. Tell them what the Bible says, Timothy. Not what man thinks. Tell them what, what the word of God says, Timothy, not what women think. Tell them what the Bible says, Timothy, not what Fox News thinks. Tell them what the word of God says, Timothy, not what CNN thinks. Tell them what the word of God says, Timothy, not what the White House thinks. And I'm not against any of those. I'm for them. But I'll tell you this. This is what I stand for. and This is what God has us to stand for. And it, listen to me. It takes more courage to stand for this book and for your God than it does to sell out on the corner and put your hat on backwards and chill the rest of the day. I like that. Well, I don't care if you like it. I'm preaching. Next time you preach, you tell them you'll like it. It's good stuff. Hey, the Pharisees were teaching all kinds of different things to them. And in the Bible, where, where, where Paul wrote in, in, the, in the, these three letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, he uses that word doctrine or teach 32 times. It's the same Greek word. And so in the early church, there were believers that were taught the word of God. You know what we have here today? In the 21st century, we have a first century church is what we want to have. A first century church that's sold out to Jesus and does what Jesus wants and lives the life that he wants us to live through his power, through him working through us. And many churches today, listen to me, 
Many church days, you got pulpits, choir lofts that are places of entertainment and, and not enlightenment and rich enrichment and the music is worldly and it that makes you want to, you know, I listened to some stuff this morning. I told my wife, man, that kind of that kind of gets me going. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with some music to get you going if it's God's music. Right. And it should. But, but Timothy, man, Timothy, don't let him teach any other doctrine. We need God in our church, son. We need God to be there. God builds the church. God does this. God wants the church to be what it is. Brother Bird, what kind of programs are you doing in that inner city to make all those people come to church? We just preach the word. Sir, what kind of programs do you have for my kids? Well, we're going to put them in a room and preach the Bible to them. How about that? Preach the devil right out of your kids. Bring them on. How's that? Well, what kind of things do you do with our kids? Well, we take the Bible and beat them over the head with it. How about that? <laughs> no, we don't beat them over the head with it, but kind of metaphorically speaking, we do. Amen. Hey, listen to me, Timothy. Be careful. <coughs> Teach them. Hey, God had committed the word of God to Paul, and he's trying to teach Timothy. Now, listen to me. How does this apply to us? Because God committed to me, and I'm trying to teach you, and now God's committed to you, and you need to teach someone else. You need to deliver. Look at verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. He committed the word of God to Paul. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Turn over to chapter number 6 very quickly, and, 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 and look at verse number 20. Oh, Timothy? Now, folks, it's only five chapters. You just kind of... Oh, Timothy! Some of us went like this. <laughs> That's okay. That, that, that is okay. I, I've told the story before. My mom and dad, when they came to church the very first time, they was like... And they were giggling. Everybody had stopped. The whole church had stopped. My mom and dad were like... <laughs> And I'm like, oh. <laughs> Verse number 20, chapter number 6. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Did you guys see that, how that so much applies 20 centuries later? Amen. Timothy, keep the doctrine has been committed to your trust because some people believe in these, these vain babblings, empty talk. That's what a guy that gets up in the pulpit without this book does. Empty talk, vain babbling, profane talking. God's not into that. These, these guys on TV want to hate everybody and say everything bad about people and call it doctrine of God. No. No, no. And then it says, an opposition of science falsely so-called. You know, the scientists, well, this, this dinosaur, the, this alligator is 60 billion years old. Now, folks, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but how in the world can you do anything to anything and find out that it's 60 billion? billion years old and when they do that stuff whatever it's what's it called carbon. carbon dating they test it three times get three different dates and pick one this is exactly what they do it's a falsely science well we evolved from monkeys well how come they're still monkeys <laughs> that should answer everybody they're still monkeys so obviously we didn't evolve uh, from monkeys hey we came from fish well they're still fish well, the, the whale walked back. This is what they say about whales. They had feet, and 10 million years ago, they walked back into the ocean and lost their feet. They, they told us that on a ship one day. We were whale watching, and the lady says that, and Kara grabs me. Please don't say anything. I was about to get up, get the microphone, say, that's wrong. Hey, opposition of science falsely so-called. I mean, 2,000 years ago, God wrote, it's falsely. And then it says, which some have professing have erred. Hey, you understand? They erred from the faith. They got to believe in that dumbness on the internet. Folks, be careful about that internet. Because there's, there's a bunch of retards on there. 
and, I, and I'd love to start naming their names for you, like Steve Anderson's and stuff like that, where, where he sits there and, and, and picks a verse and starts saying, well, here it is. <laughs> but if you read the rest of it, it doesn't, isn't where it is. Right. It, it, it's just, it's, it's weird. Now, Paul committed to Timothy, who, who, who had had God committed it to Paul before that. And, and then look, it was Timothy's responsibility to guard against the faith. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. You should be right there if we're at six. And in verse number 12, I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm just trying to help. First Timothy chapter one, verse number 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know in whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold Fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and in love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. We keep it by God who lives inside of us. Timothy, it's your responsibility to guard against the faith. Your soldier. And listen to this. Look at chapter number two real quick right there. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace of the, that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same, same commit thou to faithful men. It's your responsibility to pass it along, Timothy. Right. And listen, why would God let 2,000 years later give us this book? It's not a history book. It's, it's a teaching book. It's going to teach us, man, we've got we to we do these things ourselves. And so that's what Timothy was. And, and so number one, we're soldiers of the king carrying out orders from the king. Number two, we're not to give heed to false teachings. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number uh, one, verse number four, back in our, our text verse. Verses. Verse four, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. You ever listen to somebody that doesn't have the Bible and they want to tell you how God is and tell you all about who God is and what they believe and they got no verses? You know what those are? They're just kind of giving you little fables, things they'd heard of people. And fables is the same word we get our word myth from in the Greek. We get the word myth from that. Old stories that are made up that are not true. Timothy, don't give heed to fables. And then it says endless genealogies. Now, everybody listen to me. A genealogy in the Bible is, there's many places in the Bible we see genealogies. We see that Adam was born. And he had, I can't get into any of their names. He had a, na a son named Seth. And then Seth had a son, and this had a son, and he had a son, and he had a son, and, and, and then Lamech had a son, and Methuselah had a son, and, and they go, those are genealogies. My genealogy would be, we would start with Dale, and, uh, and KK, and Amelia, and then come to Daddy, and Mama, and then our moms and dads, and then their moms, dad. that's a genealogy. So he says, neither give heed to fables or endless genealogies. He's not saying, like Matthew chapter 1 gives us a genealogy, from, 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 I believe from Adam to Jesus. And it shows us how Jesus came through the bloodlines. And, and we need that. That's something we need to have. It's in the word of God. But he says, don't give heed to the endless genealogies. What he is saying there, and then this is true of some folks, and this is true of some good folks that I may know. But sometimes they take these genealogies and they want to insert angelic beings in there. Uh, there's a part in the Bible in Genesis where it says the, uh, it talks about the sons of God. And some people want to say these were angels that came down and impregnated women. And they had giants as kids. Now, I do not believe that at all. And, and that is not where my doctrine is going to be shifted. I know some people that kind of believe that stuff. They're good men and I like them, but they're wrong. And, and so there are people in these endless genealogies that were telling Timothy, man, that, you know, here's where the angels came in. And, and listen, here's what happened over here. And it had been 400 years since Jesus had talked, to, since, since God had talked to anybody at this time. Now, listen to me. God, in the, in the book of Malachi, 
decides he's not going to talk to Israel no more because they were disobedient and they weren't doing right. And he left for 40 years, not a prophet, nobody spoke of God or heard of God. And so they got so mixed up that now they have these endless genealogies and things, and, and they're telling Timothy, you know, you know this is true, and that's, it's a myth. It's not true. And you know that this person had this person because of some angel and da da da. It's not true. And listen, we may not have people in here trying to tell us about angelic beings getting women pregnant and different things, but we got people trying to get you on some talk that means nothing, that's taking you nowhere, that has nothing to do with nothing. If it ain't in the Bible, I do not believe it, and I have no problem telling about it. I don't believe it. <laughs> if it ain't got it in the Word of God, then I don't believe it. Well, you're one of those narrow-minded people. Absolutely right. You got me, per you got me picked out perfect. It's exactly what I am. Well, how narrow are you? Well, just take a look. About that narrow. And, and, and I'm doing just fine with it. And, and so, but, hey, Timothy, be careful. Don't believe in these false teachers and this nonsense. And look, we've got nonsense that we're trying to teach you. That's why you got to know the word of God so you don't have to worry about that. And so we're not to give heed to false teaching. Number three, we're to stick with God's truth that encourage us to live for him and edify us. What's the word edify mean? It means builds us up. That's what we stick with. That's what he tells Timothy there. Look, Timothy, neither give heed to fables and genealogies, which minister questions, but rather godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Hey, those people weren't, aren't promoting God's saving plan. You know what the church is here for? Folks, listen to me. Church isn't here for you to sit on Sunday morning and hang out and that's it. The church is a called out assembly of born again baptized believers that have come together to do God's work. Reach the world. And these people that have these endless genealogies, fables, they don't want to do God's work. They want to have social clubs and hate mongering and, and, and be mad at everything. And God wants us to do something for him. And so they were leading people away from the truth. And that's what he was trying to warn Timothy about. Be careful that you don't get led away from the truth. This book, part of it, is 3,500 years old. New Testament's 2,000 years old. 50 million people died over this book. And nobody ever could stop it. Why? Because it's super natural with a heartbeat. You can't stop it. Hey, Timothy, don't get taken off the book. Folks, that's what we need to concentrate on with our lives. But you know what your flesh wants to do? And you know what, you're, you're the person that is contrary to God, what you have one of those inside of you. You know what that wants to do? It wants to take the easy way out. Oh, well, I don't want to do that. I want to live for the Lord. I want to live for me. And that's everybody. Be careful, Timothy, you don't get taken away from those that want to live for themselves. Instead of producing love and purity and a good conscience and sincere faith, they were causing divisions and hypocrisies. And, and look what he says. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. That word charity is what I like to call love on wheels, which means you don't just tell somebody you love them, you do something about it. And it means something. He says, the end of the commandment to you, Timothy, to everybody is charity out of a pure heart. You know what the only thing in the world that will make your heart pure? Right. That right there. Not me, not this building, but this book will make your heart pure. He said the end of commandment is charity out of a pure heart. And, and God wants us to have a pure heart. And then it says, look what it says, and of a good conscience. Now I want to talk about that, and that's really where my message is today. And we won't be long. We're almost done. Paul used the word conscience 21 times in his books. And he uses the word conscience in this book five times. And he uses it another time in 2 Timothy. So when God mentions a word and keeps repeating himself in the Bible, it's important that we understand why he keeps doing the repeating and what he's doing. The word conscience means this, to know with. Conscience is the inner judge that accuses us when we've done wrong or and approves us when we've done right. It's the inner judge 
that accuses us when we've done wrong and approves us when we've done right. And listen to me, everybody has one. And he says, charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience. Now, I want to show you some places here in, in, in Timothy of that word conscience, and I want to help you today. And I want you to see something because I promise you this is going to help you. Look at 1 Timothy 19, chapter number 1, 19. This verse 19, sorry. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Then it lists Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Paul says, if you don't keep your conscience right about him and about what he wants you to do, when God tells you to do something, you're to answer with a good conscience and make a good decision. And if you don't, you will have made your life shipwrecked. And Hymenaeus and this other dude, I forgot his name, Alexander, Paul said, I... I gave them over to Satan that they learn how to act right. And, and listen to me, I don't want God to push me away because I won't listen to him with my conscience. And today, you know, Timothy, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience. Do you have a good conscience today? Are you wanting to do what God wants you to do or does your conscience only answer for what you want to do? Paul thanked God with his life that he served with a pure conscience. Don't turn him to 1 Timothy 3, 9, holding the mystery of faith and a pure conscience. He said, I'm glad that I can serve the Lord with a pure conscience. Now, folks, I am unperfect, don't do well a lot, make a lot of mistakes. But today I'm serving the Lord with a pure conscience. And tomorrow I'll wake up and, and beg God, I hope, to serve him with a pure conscience. Because that's what God would have me to do. An imperfect man who makes many mistakes serving God with a pure conscience. Now go past the second Timothy to the book of Titus. Titus chapter number 1 and verse number 15. And we're almost done. Don't get too, uh, too uh, we may need to turn the AC on here. Y'all look real comfortable. <laughs> we needed about 64 degrees in here all times. Right, Miss Daisy? Yes, Pastor. <laughs> Titus 1.15. Now look at it. We're going to get right in here, and I want you to see something. Five minutes. Unto the pure are all things pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. 2,000 years ago, <laughs> God says, their mind and conscience is defiled. The people that don't want to serve God they don't want to do right. Their mind and conscience is defiled, man. They don't even know they don't. They, they, they don't even feel it. You ever meet somebody that's dead wrong, you know they're wrong, and they can't see it, from, uh, just can't see it? Their conscience is defiled. And he, he says, hey, their conscience is defiled. It's possible to sin against the conscience so that it becomes defiled. And that happens to a lot of believers too. Uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Turn back to 1 Timothy real quick. And you're doing really well today. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. And look at verse number 2. Now look at verse number 1. Too good to miss. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly 
that in the latter times, what days are we living in, Brother Burton? The latter times. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. What's a seducing spirit? A demonic spirit. And the doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Look at it now. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's the world we're living in today, folks. And Timothy was living in it that day. It's still going on, still happening. Repeated sinning. Listen to me now. Repeated sinning. Well, some of you are starting to think like, well, sinning like murdering and stealing. No, no. Sin. Without asking God to forgive you of it and getting your heart right with God, no matter what it is, tell a lie and keep on telling them and not feel bad about it and your conscience will get seared like a hot iron. I don't know if you know what seared is. Uh, they sear meats. You, 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 they put something down on top. At McDonald's, they use a sear, a big giant. They put a bunch of patties out. Back in the old days when I was a kid, we'd flip them. Now they have this thing, they pull down, and they sear them. Hey, he says, having a, you keep on sinning, you'll have a hot iron sear in your conscience. And when your conscience gets seared, churned, you might not make it back. He says, in the latter days, the Spirit is speaking expressly that people are going to fall by seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, I'm not here to throw rocks at anybody, folks. But some of these so-called churches, that, the doctrine ain't from the Bible. So where could it be from? From the devil. Some of these so-called churches with these so-called Bible versions. If it ain't, listen, if there's more than one copy of the word and there's different versions, then we don't even have one copy. Because there can only be one. If somebody walks in here and says, I'm Burton Gates, you say, uh, no, I know who Burton Gates is. There's only one. There's only one book right. in the English language. Yeah. And, and, and listen to me, God wants us to understand that. And so he's telling Timothy, Timothy, have a good conscience. And that's why he speaks to Timothy all through the book and Titus. They're called the pastoral epistles. In those three books, he's talking to those two young men of God, and he's saying, watch your conscience. Because, folks, listen to me. I could make, I could justify and rationalize my walk with God down to nothing and believe that it's okay. Uh, well, you know, uh, maybe, I'm, maybe, maybe I got him at church too much. Maybe it's just too much. No, well, I can tell you right in the Bible why I come Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Thursdays. It's in the Bible. Uh, well, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, and maybe I don't have to read my Bible every day and, and, and pray and walk with God. It's not true. I got to have the Word of God. And I got to talk to God every day. Prove it to you from the Bible. And, and, and so I can get into doing my own thing and think it's okay. I've told Brother Paul, Paul's my assistant. He's here to help me. I said, but Paul, if I ever mess this up and start getting off balance and start messing up things, man, you better come and tell me and you better talk to our people and make sure they get rid of me. I don't want to be here with the wrong stuff. Hey, listen to me. Timothy, you got to watch out, man. You got to have a charity out of a pure heart. Pure heart's made by God. Love people, do right, Timothy. Don't give heed to these endless genealogies and these fables and that doctrine they got. Love people out of a pure heart. And, and then listen to me. Make sure you got a good conscience. Make sure it doesn't get seared. Make, <laughs> make sure it doesn't get defiled. Make sure that it's, it's, it's pointed to me. And then he goes on, and, and let's just very quickly, I want to read it to you. Uh, and a faith unfeigned. 
I, I don't want to forget that one, and I didn't put it in my notes. But faith unfeigned, I want you to listen to this. That's real faith. And it's only real because this little thing that's underneath, I don't know what's wrong with this screen, but because of that Bible that's in the background. It's only real because of what the Word of God makes it. Faith unfeigned. Not, not, well, you know, we don't have to have this Bible. I mean, they, the NIV is in better language so we can understand it more. But it was, it was written by men named Westcott and Hort who were into goblins and goons and weren't saved and were working for the Catholic Church. Wicked men. And, and then it was, it was written by a pro-homosexual woman and man uh, that, that took out all the words that God had in them and changed them all so that it would be okay to be that stuff. Hey, it ain't no more right to be that than to be a drunk or a liar or a thief. They're all wrong. Can't take the words out. And, and so, Timothy, watch out. Faith unfeigned from which some having swerved and turned aside on the vain jangling. Man, they swerved out of it, skirt, swerved in, and now they're vain, emptily, empty talk, vain jangling. And folks, you'll meet them. They're vain. Man, they're, they're saying stuff that makes no sense, and, and, and they, they use big words, and they'll act like they know something, and they'll tell you something, and it just it's almost amazing that they say those things. Oh, really? Okay. I mean, at the doorsteps, they tell me this. I can't go to church. I know God. I'm going to go to church. Well, man, well, get your Bible. What does this mean? What's this mean and what's this mean? Well, you know, I just believe that this is this. I mean, you're a vain jangler. And I ain't messing with you. Desiring to be teachers of the law and understand not what they teach, neither where they affirm it. They teach stuff and don't even know where they got it from. And can't even say, hey, I, I know I heard it somewhere. Where'd you learn that at? Well, somewhere. Isn't that true, though? Uh, I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, but we know the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. See, these folks were trying to impose laws and statutes on Timothy's people, and God had set them free. He said, we don't need the law if everybody's saved and doing right. We need God's grace and God to help people. The law was there to bring us to Jesus. The law is for people that can't do it right. Hey, you know what we have speed limits for? For the lawless. It's true. So, well, who's lawless in here? All of you. Except Frank Bowles. Yes, that's right. He will not speed, and it makes me mad. <laughs> Frank, hurry up. Speed limit's 55, Pastor. <laughs> He's the only person I know that keeps the speed limits. I miss Linda too, but, but if I see you coming, I'm, I'm jumping on the sidewalk, Miss Linda. <laughs> and listen to me. Verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for the sinners, for the unholy, the profane, the murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, manslayers, whoremongers, for them to defile themselves with mankind. What's that? Homosexuality. For men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, for, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. It, it, Timothy, any other thing that's contrary to this book, that's what the law was made for according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Finally, number five, six, whatever number it is, God committed it to us, and we need to live for it. That's what real Christianity is, folks. It isn't, uh, you know, get a pastor that, that, that doesn't care about nobody and just never says anything and tries to help nobody and pre doesn't preach the word and is just interested in the offering bowl. I'm not interested in the offering bowl. You ain't got to give anything here. God, God will take good care of this church and his people. He is not, not stressed out. He ain't broke, he ain't worried. But what I am interested in is God working through people and me preaching the word of God like it is because listen to me, what just happened in here is I read the book just like it is preached it just like it was taught, and now God supernaturally works inside everybody that listened. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Nobody looking around just for a minute. If you're in here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that if you died right now, 
you are not sure that you would go to heaven with him, could I please just pray for you? Would you be honest before the Lord, before myself, and let me pray for you today? We will not come get you. We will not call you out. I just want to pray for you. Would you slip your hand up right now and say, Preacher, pray for me.